All righty. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to give everyone a, a couple seconds to join the webinar here. While you're joining, what I'll ask you to do is to, as a bit of an icebreaker, I'll get you to use the chat function in your Zoom toolbar. In that chat function, if you can just let us know what city, town, province, territory, or even internationally, where are you tuning in from today? I am uh, privileged to be tuning in from Fredericton, New Brunswick today, actually. Usually I'm in, in Ottawa, but I'm happy to be tuning in from the, this side of the world here. And uh, we've got a, a couple panelists who are joining us today for a fantastic new presentation. Uh, one of our final ones before we get to the summer here. So uh, today's presentation or today's webinar is going to be titled The One Negative Pressure Wound Therapy Decision Tree for Open Wounds. And I'm happy to be joined by Dr. Marie-Claude Lacroix-Boulanger and Dr. Kevin Wu. And I'll introduce them in just a second. Before we get there, though, I want to remind everybody that we will be having a Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. To ask a question at any point during the presentation, I'll ask you to use that Q&A function in your Zoom toolbar. So not the chat, but the Q&A function, and that'll make sure that we can uh, get to that question for you. This uh, presentation is being recorded and it will be made available. So if you or your colleagues need to access it later, you will be able to do so uh, on our NSWOC website. And finally, everyone who's tuning in live today will be receiving a certificate of attendance and we'll send that via email uh, within the next couple of days. So without further ado, I'm really happy to introduce our presenters for today, starting with Dr. Kevin Wu, who holds the rank of full professor at Queen's University Faculty of Health Sciences in Kingston, Ontario. He's an adjunct research professor at Western University, and he's known as an established Canadian researcher and educator in the fields of wound management, aging, and chronic disease management. He has published over 160 peer-reviewed papers and received national and international awards for his work. Dr. Wu serves as the chair of the Joint Research Ethics Boards for the West Park Health Center and Toronto Grace Health Center in Toronto. Dr. Wu is a founding member and the president of the Canadian Pressure Injury Advisory Panel, a Canadian organization uh, uh, advocate for policy change and to raise public awareness about pressure, pressure injury prevention and management. He also maintains an active clinical role in wound care. And Dr. Marie-Claude is also going to be joining us, Dr. Marie-Claude Lacroix-Boulanger, who is a vascular surgeon at Hôtel Dieu de Lévis Hospital. Uh, she's currently working in Lévis, Quebec as a vascular and general surgeon, as I mentioned, and she received her medical degree from the Université, Université Laval in Quebec City as a, uh, in general surgery residency in Sherbrooke, Quebec. Her fellowship training in acute care surgery and trauma in Edmonton, Alberta, and fellowship training in vascular and endovascular surgery in Ottawa. Marie-Claude is passionate about teaching, and in her spare time, she enjoys the outdoors and traveling. So without further ado, I'm really excited to be presenting this webinar, which has kindly been made possible today by Smith & Nephew. I'm going to hand over the mic to Dr. Kevin Wu. Thanks, Kevin. Great. Thank you so much, Troy, for a very kind introduction. And it's such an honor to be presenting today with uh, Dr. Lacroix Boulanger and uh, on this very interesting topic. I hope it will be interesting for, for all of you today as well. And I want to thank you again for NSWOC uh, for hosting this and organizing this event. And also want to thank you for uh, Smith and Nephew for supporting this event. And this is our disclosure in terms of uh, the material we're presenting, representing our own opinions and beliefs and experiences. And we are both uh, paid consultants for Smith and Nephew for the purpose of this presentation. So anyway, the learning objective for today, we're hoping by the end of this educational program, you'll be able to uh, be able to be more aware of the evidence and clinical rationale for uh, the support, the development of this 2023 one MPWT decision tree for open wounds. We're going to review the operational and economic outcomes for using one MPWT. We're going to apply this tree, this algorithm, if you may, uh, and, and really trying to illustrate how that help us to make decisions at various points using some case studies. And we're going to critique uh, when and where to use traditional negative pressure wound therapy versus single negative pressure wound therapy. I'm sure that this is the burning question in a lot of, of people's mind because there's so many different devices out there. So how do I make a decision in terms of using a, a, a power device versus a one-time use device, disposable device? Um, so I think uh, uh, this is uh, some of the goals that we want to achieve for this evening. 
So I think to warm us up a little bit and uh, just to get us, you know, engage in the conversation, I have a few questions for you. So I think uh, Troy can help us to, to get this poll question on your screen so you can actually respond to this question. Do you consider transitioning your patients from traditional MPWT to single MPWT in your practice? Um, I'm sure that we have um, heard about it and we just heard about that. So I'm, I'm just curious about in your practice, in clinical setting, do you often think about and, and utilize both traditional and single use MPWT? And people are clicking like crazy, which is good. And it looks like we're about halfway now. Are you okay if I show the results there? Sure. Kevin? Yeah. Fantastic. Please. And you should be able to see the results on your screen. That's very interesting. So I think uh, we've got one third of using never and about a majority of using sometimes and 6% saying always, which is interesting. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Mary Cloud and, and I are going to, to talk a little bit more about um, scenarios where we, we have to think about both modalities because they're very, very different and different functionalities as well. So next question. What are some of the reasons for transitioning from traditional to single-use MPWT, naked pressure wind therapy? Do you think because there are different unique functions between the two different devices? Do you think it's because of cost or because of patient preferences? I think we should actually put in uh, condition preferences as well. And let's see. Leave it open for just a couple more seconds. We're almost there. Lovely. Okay, over 50% participated. So you should be able to see the results on your screen now. Interesting outcome as well. I think uh, a lot of you recognize there's some different unique characteristics between the two traditional and single use MPWT. Um, I think definitely patient preference should be considered um, and including clinician preferences. Uh, and, and a lot of times when I talk about single use naked pressure wind therapy, in addition to the unique features they come with that modality, a lot of times it's just so easy and so straightforward for clinicians to apply for the patients and easy to learn. Great. Um, well, let's see the next question, shall we? And the question is now, well, it seems like a lot of you have considered the, the two different modalities and have used and experiences using the two different types of, of devices. Do you have some kind of standardized criteria to start and stop MPWT? And I'll share the responses now for you. Holy cow, um, a lot of you are saying yes. Uh, love, love to have a, have, have a conversation with all the people who say yes and, and really try to get a better understanding. Because when we look at nationally and even internationally, um, we may have very local criteria and, and, and even in our minds, we have the, the algorithm follow into helping us to make some of those decisions. But a lot of times they're not really well articulated or well published. It'll be interesting to see the, the collective wisdom, what we can come up with and whether it resonates with the, this, the decision tree that we have developed. Okay, uh, I think this is the last question. So currently, how confident do you feel in transitioning from traditional MPWT to single use MPWT? I know there are a lot, lots of choices here, A, B, C, D, and E. And just a couple more seconds and we should get there. Perfect, you should see the results on your screen now. All right, well, this is a, a very interesting split here. Uh, a lot of you um, saying that there, we're still on the, the less com confident, less comfortable side. So we're hoping by the end of this presentation, we'll be able to to switch this attitude, switch this uh, confidence level a little bit. Um, we'll see at the end of this presentation. 
So am I in control of the screen? Yes, okay. So just to uh, introduce why the traditional uh, negative pressure wound um, was changed or modified to the single use, you know, when you want to create a new or improve something, you identify the challenges of the, of the therapy of the treatment, and then you make it the basis of the improvement of the new therapy or treatment. So that's what happened here. So they identified the challenges with the traditional therapy, and then we, we can group them in three groups. So if we start with the first one, which is in the pink one, the first category of challenges was exposed or mentioned by the healthcare provider, which is you, which is me, the doctors, the nurses that are in charge of the patient. They initially found that if you don't have enough teaching or enough experience, well, probably the, the way you put on the traditional dressing is complicated and not reliable. So this is the first challenges that was identified. The second one was on the blue one, which is the clinical, which is the patient perspective of the traditional therapy. So as the chronic or acute wound are um, the prevalence is rising, and also we identify more and more indication of using the therapy. While the demand in the clinical setting is growing, they came up with probably the single use therapy that could be better. Not better, but used differently. And if one of the category is rising, will it affect the other one? because the three challenges boxes are connected. The third one is the one in the middle, which is the financial aspect, the economic. As a society, we decided that the, I don't know where everyone is coming from, but in Canada, in Quebec, we decided that most of the healthcare was free. Doesn't mean that all the dressing, the care and the teaching that we give the patient is free, so everything come as a cost, and we need to be cost effective about all these changes. So when people, when we talk about the traditional, I'm not sure if everyone is clear about that, but is the therapy where all the component comes in a separate package, and then we build our own dressing, and then it's connected to the canister, and the canister is connected to the wall, which could be um, restraining for the patient. And all those components need to be put in the right way, de depending on what wound we are facing. So I understand from a clinical perspective that this, this is challenging. Um, if I change, if I go here. And I think just, just to add to that, Mary Claude, I think uh, it's not just about nurses. And I, I think more and more often I see surgeons like yourself would apply yeah. advice in, in the operating room. So I think exactly. it's helping you guys to learn about this skill in, in your clinical practice too. I know because I have um, a lot of colleagues that initially didn't know how to put uh, on simple wounds, didn't know how to put all the items of the traditional, and they didn't even think about putting the traditional therapy on that typical wound. So, so I think, yeah, you're right. It's not only the nurses, it can be the uh, students, can be the surgeon or the um, doctors that are in the uh, clinical wound care clinic. I'm trying to change the slide. Oh, okay, then help. Okay, so again, this is just another way of um, explaining all those challenges that were the basis of the improvement of building the single use therapy. As I said, from a patient perspective, that treatment can be long and painful and reduce their quality of life. And, you know, when you do a treatment, you want to do yeah, a quality of life for the patient, but your quality of act and the act there was uh, meant to be improved with the single therapy. 
Um, pe people, when they have traditional therapy, can be uh, dependent on family. They need to come every two or three days in the clinic. They need to be taken care of. And I feel like they're not implicated enough in their therapy because we do everything for them. And I like when the patient is in charge of their own health and they understand what they're going through and they take part of it because they're in charge of their health and they feel less um, left on the side and more in this decisive uh, um, intention when uh, we explain them that we're transitioning to single one and we are bringing them back faster to their mobility and to their uh, normal activity or normal life, which you cannot really do with this traditional um, therapy. From an operational perspective, there's less step, there's less uh, paper in discharge, the patients stay usually less longer in the hospital because it doesn't need to be plugged in the wall, and uh, it doesn't go as much um, frequently in the outside clinic to change the dressing, and usually if there's a problem with the dressing, he can or she can address it by themselves. So again, we don't infantilize them. We just make them in charge of their own health. And from a financial perspective, if it means there's less uh, material use, there's less visit in clinic, and they go back to their normal life faster, well, the financial aspect of it is um, taken care of. We can go back later on, but I'm seeing the time moving. So I'm just gonna click further. So this is, we know that the negative pressure therapy is now a gold standard. As we all clicked uh, in the poll question, we know that there's a lot of wounds and a lot of acute or chronic wound that can be or need to be treated with negative therapy. Um, and the traditional therapy is a multi-patient use. We need to do the maintenance of this. It's like a car. You can you, you need to make the maintenance of the tubing, the canister, and the, the box itself. It needs um, to be powered with electricity so the patient is bound to the wall or mainly in the hospital. They, they sometimes go home with a smaller box, but still they cannot go back to full on range of activity, mainly because the initial pathology is, you know, restraining themselves either because we amputated a leg or a toe, so they cannot go running around, but usually they can go back to working on the phone or doing their own stuff at home. So for the single use, and we're gonna explain them what the, the basis of this dressing and how it's made later on in the presentation, but it's, um, it comes in one package, all the components are already set up all together. They all, there are some different form, different length, different, um, uh, what is, width? Large, the large side of a, a square. And uh, you dispose it after. It doesn't need to be changed every two to three days. It can be put on for seven days. As the dressing fill himself, the, um, the humidity of and the exudate of the dressing goes evaporation by the silicone side of it. And you don't really need a filler except when the wound needs it. And it's um, battery powered. So you can change the battery yourself when it's running out of power. So this is the basic uh, difference between those two. Right, and, and it's nice, uh, it's a very nice table and nicely explained, uh, thank you so much. And I think in preparation of this presentation, uh, I, you know, we, we, we talked about the, the importance of doing assessment and also evaluation, whether the negative pressure wound therapy is warranted or should be continued. I, and, and I said, well, I have this wonderful case I really, really want to share with, with the group. As you can see, this is a wound actually on a, um, a dehesed wound on a residual limb. And the traditional wound therapy, the negative pressure wound therapy was applied for about four weeks. I think initially it was actually improving and there's some granulation tissue and everyone was so, was so gung-ho and say, well, this is really getting better and it will close in another four weeks. 
but it has not improved. And uh, so I think it's really a good lesson learned um, and, and also reminding us that we need to come back to evaluate whether there's any change in the wound characteristics that, that would really uh, justify the continuation of the pressure wound therapy. Because when I look at this wound, I thought, okay, I need to clean up some of those uh, non-viable fatty tissue. And often that's a little tricky because when you see fatty tissue, should we get it, you know, remove that or should we keep it on for a little while? So I was brave enough at that time and I thought, okay, let's, let's explore. And lo and behold, you can see that uh, using a curette and I can actually puncture that area. And what you can see here is when it's opened, I was able to uh, evacuate and drain a, a, a I think it was about 500 cc of, of fluid from the cavity. So I think it's, it's really a good reminder that, that uh, don't always think about continuation of the therapy just because it is being used. Uh, I, I think we can all echo that too. Okay. So part of the, um, the impetus for us to work on this presentation and, and also to develop this kind of algorithm is to enhance clinical practice. So I was, uh, uh, it, it's such an honor to be able to be the chair for, for this uh, Canadian panel. And that include a few different uh, clinicians from across Canada. Uh, some of you may, uh, you may know uh, uh, Dr. Lee, Dr. Uh, uh, Puket, and also Dr. Of course, uh, Dr. Lacroix Boulanger and Dr. Powell from London, Ontario, and also Dr. Wong from Toronto. So they come up with really lots of vignettes, wonderful cases to showcase how the naked pressure wound therapy is being used and how, being how the therapy is being transitioned from traditional therapy to the single use therapy in a variety of cases. So today uh, we're just going to talk about a few different cases that uh, especially pertaining to our own sort of uh, own experiences. Uh, but this is the, the, the tree, the algorithm. As you can see, there are a few different key indicators and key determinants when we're thinking about the use of naked pressure wind therapy, uh, uh, whether it is the traditional versus a single use. So the three questions are, does the wind fit comfortably under one of the single use uh, uh, naked pressure wind therapy? What is the level of exudate? Usually, the traditional negative pressure wound therapy is being used for high exudate, highly exudated wounds versus low to moderate. We'll consider, if appropriate, the single use. And also, the third question is Does the dressing conform to the wound bed? And I think uh, part of the reason why negative pressure wound therapy works so well is the direct contact, the direct ability to stimulate the granulation process. So I think the, the intimal, intimate contact to the wound surface, to the tissue, is vital to the, um, to the outcome of, of, of the therapy. So a few questions. What, are the, what is the exudate level? Um, will the single-use therapy fit? And also, does it conform to the wound bed? So let's look at some cases. So the first case I want to share with you is actually, um, as you can see, this is the abdomen um, on the lady. Um, she actually was a little obese, and uh, unfortunately, um, she um, had a um, recurrence of colon cancer, uh, result in a surgical intervention, um, and the wound dehesed. And of course, the uh, what we identify is the need to close this wound as early as possible given there's a lot of risk factors for infection. And she also has a history of breast cancer. So lots of cancer history. Um, initially, when we look at this wound, um, uh, she had been uh, uh, using some other sort of traditional dressing for a while. And as you can see, it doesn't really looking extremely healthy. There's a lot of fiber tissue. The wound size was about 14 by six. So there's a little bit of depth to it. Um, and there's, uh, there's some thick, um, tenacious fluid coming out from the wound. So we ask ourselves those key questions. Well, can we use PICO dressing, the single-use naked pressure wound therapy? What is the exudate level is like? And, and in reflection, I think the wound is actually not that deep. We can potentially 
use a single-use naked pressure wound therapy. But because of the high volume of it today, and we need to contain the fluid, the, the fluid as much as we can, uh, recognizing that, as Mary Claude mentioned, that we don't really change the dressing that often. So we better have a, 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 a device that will be able to handle those type of fluid. Um, so we decided that we'll use the traditional therapy first. We use the, the, uh, the, the, the Renesis uh, for a duration of time. And uh, we use the foam base. And then uh, after a while, we switch that. Uh, once the wound actually starts to improve, we um, uh, remove the dressing and remove the tra traditional therapy and replace it with the single-use negative pressure wound therapy. And the reason why we transition from the traditional to single, because of the reduction in the amount of exudate, the resolution of infection, she was on antibiotics. We thought that the, the, uh, the earlier that we can mobilize this patient, the better and recognizing that the outcome is for her to return home and return to, uh, for allow her to return back to work. Um, so at that time, the exit level was kind of moderate level. We're a little bit iffy about whether this is going to be successful or we need to switch it back to traditional, but we thought, okay, let's give it a try. Uh, after the uh, seven days of treatment with the traditional wound therapy, um, and we continue with our um, sharp debridement and cleaning off some of the non viable tissue to make sure that we have a clean wound bed to facilitate the negative pressure on the uh, on the healing process. And, um, and a lot of times we ask the question why PICO or single negative pressure wound therapy would work in fact in some wounds better than the traditional negative pressure wound therapy. Um, and I think some of those properties, features, are not unique to single-use negative pressure wound therapy. Yes, all the negative pressure wound therapy devices can protect, can remove wound fluid, actually in some cases can actually facilitate the debridement process by producing this moist wound bed, facilitating the, um, the uh, MMPs and all the macrophages to, to digest all the non-viable tissue. And yes, we can reduce edema, increase blood flow, and also promote granulation process. That's not unique to the single-use negative pressure wound therapy. But what we recognize is by using the single-use therapy, the, the dressing, the entire dressing, actually produce negative pressure on the entire interface. So this is a very, very interesting slide to compare the amount of negative pressure and where the pressure is being applied across the, uh, the intersection of the, wound, uh, of the wound bed. As you can see for traditional therapy, the negative pressure is applied to where the foam or the gauze material is being placed. And basically it's around the wound bed and nothing much really in the periphery, in the peri wound skin versus the PICO single use naked pressure wound therapy because it's a piece of dressing you place directly on the wound and also in the, in the surrounding area. And you can see that there's a difference in terms of the, 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 host, the, the parameter, the surface area that is involved and that is um, being enhanced, the, 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 the property, the edema reduction, the angiogenic property, not just on the wound bed, but across the, 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 um, the other areas as well. And you can see that after two weeks of therapy, and we're able to actually kickstart the healing process a little bit better, and there's less um, sloppy tissue and some of the unhealthy um, uh, adipose tissue actually is gradually disappearing and you see the, the granulation but surfacing on the wound bed. Um, yes, we don't really see a big difference in terms of wound size, but we're actually quite encouraged by the changes on the wound bed itself. So there's some new tissue, newer blood flow, and we're able to reduce the edema and able to contain the wound fluid at the same time. So now this is a four week after therapy. This is much clearer to us that this is actually on the, on the healing pathway. Now there's a slight difference in terms of wound sizes. It's gradually getting smaller. Um, and you can also see the, 
the marking on the periwinkle skin indicating there's actually some negative pressure applied on the on the good skin without damaging the the healthy skin the fragile skin and that's i think part of the the uh, the reason why we often think about tran transitioning individuals patients from traditional therapy to single use negative pressure wound therapy in this case, because we're still a little bit concerned about infection problem, uh, we actually apply optical flex underneath the dressing, underneath the single-use therapy, um, just to make sure that we manage the local bacterial burden at the same time, recognizing this individual is high risk of infection. Um, she's on multiple different therapies uh, for cancer care. Um, in, sort of her immune system is actually not that, not that robust. So we need to address the, the risk for infection. Um, so going back to this, this, um, this algorithm here, um, why we transition, how we transition these individuals from the traditional therapy to single use therapy? Well, it's appropriate, the wound size and in terms of depth, there's low exudation and um, the filler is optional, depends whether you recognize there is a need to put in some antimicrobial dressing or there's a little depth that require a, a, a little bit filler to address the, um, the, the depth, the, the, the space. So I think uh, this is a, a very good uh, lesson for us to, to learn in terms of how uh, the two different therapies is being used in, in tandem uh, and, and at the same time producing a very, very good outcome for this individual. So the second case, I think, Mary Claude, back to you. Yep, thank you, Kevin. So that second case is um, the case of an amputated right great toe from a wet gangrene, which is a classic um, case from a vascular surgeon or a vascular ward. I'm trying to change this slide. Okay, so if I present you the case, this is a 63 year old man that was diagnosed in the past with diabetes, he's a smoker. He's got dyslipidemia and peripheral vascular disease that now is uh, transformed to critical limb ischemia. He presented with a great toe that was black, wet, and um, smelling, so probably infected. He already had in the past multiple uh, surgery to keep his leg on. On the left side, although surgery didn't work, he ended up with an above knee amputation. And on the right side, well, it started the right, like the good side now is becoming the wrong side. So we started again by doing right iliac stent uh, angioplasty, and we needed to remove that toe because it was infected. So the amputation was done, leaving the bed open because it was infected, and the patient um, agreed to uh, undergo other surgery to bring blood flow back in his legs while we're trying to save the rest of his foot slash leg. We initially um, didn't put any um, negative therapy on it because it was infected and the exudor was more of a pus um, kind of a fluid. So we did a little bit of a dressing for about a week. And then after that, we um, put the negative therapy on. If we uh, examine this wound, and that's the, that's the thing you should be doing in your head when you examine uh, a wound is um, name out loud the things that you see and basically do the opposite when you want to treat it. That's exactly what wounds are about. So this wound is deep in a weird shape. The edges are macerated and you don't see a lot of blood flow in there. So basically you got to take care of all that stuff you just mentioned. So the wound size, you measured it. The bed is actually a bit pinker, but reduced and then now they became drier as you put the dressing on with the days and the exudate became less and less uh, important. So 
Now the, the goal is to close that womb in the secondary intention and improve the wound healing. So if we go to the, oh yeah, so a brief aparte of how uh, you need, what you need to consider for this wound to be healed in a normal or a normal time frame. Just by examining your patient, you know that probably is gonna need revascularization and other adjunct for this wound to be healed. Not only dressing change, but also all the other ones that I'm gonna talk about. So revascularization is for whom? So patient with ischemic wound, basically. If they don't have ischemic wound, you don't need to revascularize them. So you need to recognize, is it like an arterial wound? Is it a mixed wound, venous plus arterial, diabetic plus arterial, or is it just a perforant diabetic lesion? Once you categorize the wound in your head, and this is an, a component with an arterial one, well, you probably need to do some pressure on that foot, on that edge, on that limb to know if you need revascularization because everything that you're gonna do is probably not gonna work because there's not enough, enough blood flow in there. For a patient that are diabetic, they usually need more pressure to heal because their autonomous system is um, affected. So they don't have all the chemotaxis cells that are coming in the wound to help the healing. So blood flow is less, chemotaxis is less, autonomic uh, system is less, so they don't heal properly like a non-diabetic pressure uh, person pressure. So usually for diabetic, you need a toe pressure over 50. And for a non-diabetic patient, 30 is usually okay if we apply all the other adjunct. When do you need to revascularize? Usually it's not right from the beginning. When the wound is failing to improve with your conservative management or with the other ones that I'm gonna talk about, well, you need to consider revascularization. We talked about the type of wound and then what type of revascularization. Well, that's gonna depend on the lesion location where it is in the arterial tree, the general patient comorbidities. If it is a fit, healthy patient, probably is going to be more of a candidate of big and invasive bypass. But if you just need this old 80 your old patient to stay in his house and heal his wound, well, you may be just gonna go with smaller procedure like endovascular of the tibial artery and then it's gonna be fine. And then usually you need to target the angiosome, which is the artery that's coming in the foot like to revascularize the region of the foot that is affected. So these are for revascularization. If we talk about like the conservative treatment and the adjunct to that, it is a multidisciplinary program. You need other people than yourself. So example for me, I'm the surgeon, but I need probably the pharmacist to help me with all these other medication that the patient can use like this. They need, they need to be on aspirin and stetsin. All the other ones, the pentoxifilin and the silostazol and the xarelto, all those medication can be considered, but they're usually a recipe for each patient. You need to offload the, the foot. So this usually a physiotherapist or a doctor, a podia, podiatrician, podiatrist, the the foot, foot doctor podiatrist and the walk-in aids you can consider hyperbaric if all the pressure that you did before answer well to uh, the oxygen therapy you need to have all the wound care and the dressing so this is what we're um, talking about today you can also consider skin substitute i like in venous ulcer you can spray new skin and then help the regeneration of the skin but the common ground of all these patients they need to be, they need to stop smoking. Whatever method, voodoo, pills, they need to stop smoking. That's the part where they need to be in charge of their um, health. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, but, uh, quick question. A lot of patients yeah. that I see, they don't have a toe. Um, so I, I like the idea of, of obtaining toe pressure um, in addition to ABPI. Um, so if patients, they don't have a toe, what other kind of mm -hmm. assessment tools do you use in, in clinical practice? 
Yeah, good point. So there have four other usually. So you can have smaller bracelet that you put around the second toe that that is working well perfectly if you have the machine for this. Or you can send them for PTCO2, which is a capture of the oxygen in um, in the skin that you're examining. And usually you can have um, the result of hyperemic. So you stimulate that, you stimulate the blood flow. And if you have an increasing in that oxygen uh, level, well, they're usually good for hyperbaric, but if there are no increase, well, usually their vessels are pretty calcified. They cannot dilate more. So they're not good candidate for hyperbaric, but it is a good measurement also. And um, uh, this is not the same uh, numbers, but um, this is another courses, I think. <laughs> so yeah, you can do PTCO2 in, an, in, in the lab. Yeah, good point. So if we go back to our um, algorithm uh, for this patient with the hole in the foot, with the toe removed, um, I think we had one with uh, all this, the green, uh, yeah. So if this wound, I'm not doing this, perfect. So the wound was initially not fit because it was too deep, an irregular form, so the, the, the edge were wet, but the exudate was becoming lower. So we did traditional therapy initially, but then we moved back to, uh, we changed. I'm trying to find my, can you change the slide someone's for me? And another one again. And again, okay. So a week after the treatment with the traditional therapy, we saw the patient again in clinic and then look at this wound. It's actually improved because we see the necrotic superior edge is now like this crust over the wound has contracted. It has still this hole on it the edge are a bit less macerated, and this has this kind of granulation or tissue that needs to be debrided a little bit inside, but not too aggressively, because you don't want to find that bone again in, in, in the back. So, because if we go back to, again, the algorithm, so could we use the single? Yes. Um, we did use um, a foam on this one, because there was a hole in there, the exudate was less. So yes, we used Pico on it. The only thing I wanna talk about when the next slide is if the patient has a pain or it doesn't really tolerate well the pressure on that side that was just amputated, but you still need to debride a little bit. I think Cento, which is the another adjunct of debridement that you can use, is this ointment, the enzymatic ointment that you can use. You put it in the, in the bed and it's gonna debride gently the wound, uh, the bed of the wound. So we, we did that on that patient and then we came back because he was not really tolerating the PICO. And then again, um, the wound bed just contracted, the wound got less deep, the exudate was basically nothing. So we didn't use the foam, like the filler. We transitioned to PICO single use therapy and we changed it about a week later. So you can change again that slide. And again, so the wound is still contracted. We see a little bit of maceration, but that's okay. You don't need to uh, address that 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 much. And everything is drier. So you continue with PICO for another seven to 10 days. And then you see again the patient and then you'll see what the bed of the wound is looking like. On and the and next. I just, just want to comment quickly that I, I noticed uh, just by yeah. doing the comparison of different pictures, there's a significant reduction in the edema compared to the last picture. Even, you know, you can see the stoop yeah. swelling going on, but by six weeks, the swelling has almost sort of disappeared completely. So it's actually quite um, quite a, 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 a key important uh, picture to show how MPWT is able to reduce edema in the periwinkle skin. 
The usual thing that I say to patients that were that they need revascularization before we treated the wound is their foot was really dry in blood. Now we brought blood, like blood back in, so they don't know how to manage it. So usually it's okay to have the leg swollen and edema post bypass or post revascularization for a couple of weeks just for the leg to adapt to it. And usually once the the edema is taken care of, you'll see a faster improvement in uh, the healing of the wound you're trying to treat. But it's part of the it's part of the treatment. That leg needs to be swollen for a couple of a couple of weeks. That's what it is. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but I think maybe this question is good to ask now while we're still talking about it. One person was asking, were you wrapping the pico under his foot to the or under the foot to the sole in this example here? We were wrapping it from the sole up like to on, the like under the foot. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, guys. under the foot onto the wound and then back on the dorsum and it was applied very gracefully on top of it and all the other toes were not uh, suctioned in and it stayed on pretty much the whole length of uh, the duration we needed for the seven days thank you so this is the end. So we didn't need to put any pico on that because like this crust is now on it and then the granulation is gonna uh, grow under and then that wound is gonna be healed in about two weeks. That's it. <laughs> wow, this is an amazing outcome. Um, just uh, difficult to follow that case uh, because it's so, um, so uh, illustrative of how the, the two different therapies uh, can, can play a different role in terms of healing process. Um, the, the next case uh, I want to present to you, uh, even though you look at the picture, it's a smaller wound, it doesn't look too bad, it's granulating, there's a good wound bed, it's moist. Now this patient is a diabetic uh, uh, for quite some time, even though he was a young guy, uh, 55 is youngish, right? Um, and uh, he had a knee surgery, um, the wound sort of opened up, and of course we want to close this area as quickly as possible, and the traditional therapy was being discontinued up to this point, because uh, every time we took off the, um, the traditional therapy, uh, it caused a little bit of trauma to the wound bed and caused a little bleeding problem, so we recognize that uh, the traditional therapy, yes, it has promoted the granulation process, up to this point, but now it may actually be not, not producing the advantages we like to see anymore. So at the at that time of the assessment, the wound was about three by three and uh, uh, the depth wasn't that bad. Um, this, you can see the, the wound margin, this epithelialization actually migrating towards the wound bed, uh, recognizing some of the new scar tissue and the wound fluid wasn't so bad. So again, following this, this algorithm, um, yes, we can probably consider a single use therapy. The exudation was moderate and thin liquid coming out from the wound bed. And uh, there's practically no, no, no depth that we need to worry about. So definitely we don't really need a filler. And the wound is healthy looking, uh, but there's no other indication that there is a local bacterial burden that we need to address at that point. So yes, we use the PICO dressing. Uh, and after one week, and you can see the um, you can see the indentation again, suggesting the negative pressure is actually not just um, exerting its function on wound bed, but also in the periphery, in the surrounding area. The granulation continued to grow into the wound bed with new epithelium epithelialization migrating in towards the wound bed. The wound. <laughs> It's getting much smaller by by uh, by this time. The measurement almost half the size of the uh, of a week ago, and uh, I think uh, it's a good place to really talk about the one of the major points. Even though it's not on the on the algorithm, but I think perhaps in the future this really should be a a touchstone to describe when the single use therapy should be considered because the goal is to facilitate epithelialization, not so much about granulation that we see often associated with the traditional therapy for deeper wound. 
Uh, once you have reached that stage, um, in fact, a lot of the traditional therapy with the removal of foam material or the gauze material, the trauma, the, um, the disturbance of the granulation tissue, the new epithelium can be counterproductive. Um, and I think this is a nice slide to show you the comparison between the single use therapy in orange color versus the traditional wind therapy in the purple color. The, um, the, the area that is able to, the reduction in the wound area is significantly faster in the single use therapy because of the new epithelium able to, to migrate towards the wound without being disturbed, without being destroyed by the, by the frequent dressing changes. Uh, so yes, uh, by four weeks, we're able to see there's a significant difference and uh, almost sort of a close 0.5 by 0.5 centimeter in size. Very, very nice uh, new epithelium. And so at that time, we decided we can just discontinue the therapy and change to a, 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 um, uh, some kind of advanced wound dressing to uh, allow patients to return home. So I think uh, one of the um, key questions people often ask is, is infection a contraindication for negative pressure wound therapy? We don't really have a, a poll uh, uh, for this particular question, but I think uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a dialogue piece, um, whether uh, uh, in the past we say, well, if there is uh, osteomyelitis, if there's infection, we should not be using negative blood pressure wound therapy, it's contraindicated. But I think the, the pendulum, the paradigm has shifted a little bit that we need to be uh, very, very aggressive at the very beginning. We want to put in all the, uh, the measures that we can promote wound healing in place at the very beginning, as early as possible. So we can reduce the chronicity of some of those, those, those nasty, difficult to heal wounds. So from my clinical standpoint, I, I'd love to hear your, um, your opinion as well, as well, Mary Claude, um, mm -hmm. that even if the wound is infected, there's no reason why we should not be considering negative pressure wound therapy. Of course, we might still consider using some kind of antimicrobial material. Um, there's all kinds of um, vehicle that we can use under, under the, the therapy, whether it is a, um, a foam material with silver or with other antimicrobial ingredients, or there's uh, powder available for us that can be placed and, and sprinkled on the wound bed. There's also other uh, cloth-like material with silver, like actical flax, that is very, very easy to place on the wound bed. But the, the key message is whatever you use uh, underneath, underneath the negative pressure wound therapy, it has to be fenestrated, allowing the negative pressure to pass through the, the, the dressing medium to the wound bed, because that, that's really making a difference in terms of wound healing process. Mary Claude, do you, you have any other opinion on this? Yeah, I do. I think I'm going uh, in your direction. The only thing I would say to uh, facilitate the judging of a wound is usually when you see pus coming out and it's black on the edge and you basically think like it's a tree in your garden that's kind of dying and you need to revive it you're not going to take like the tiny twizzlers scissors and hope it's going to go I think a wound is the same so if you think that it needs to be removed probably it needs to have surgical debridement or um, washing yourself the wound with normal saline but if ever you hesitate like oh this is not that bad it's probably more colonized there's this biofilm on it it's juicy but not that much this is the indication for um pressure therapy that would be me because you need to debride you need to remove the exudate that's basically what the, the negative pressure therapy is doing. So every, every time you're hesitating because you're not sure if it's an indication, usually you're right for a therapy. If you know that you need to debride, usually you're right. You need to remove it by yourself. So that's how I kind of uh, do it for any, any kind of wound, either abdominal, either vascular on the foot, either... Usually the, the thing I would say is usually when they're prosthetic under the wound, 
like um, like the knee you showed, the knee surgery, maybe he had some prostheses under there or the revascularization that you did with a Gore-Tex bypass, PTFE bypass. Most of the time, negative therapy is not enough. Yeah. I, I like the way you think in terms of the, the importance of being very aggressive and remove as much non-viable and healthy infected tissue as possible and then let the, the therapy uh, so work is magic to promote the you know, process. Sure. Like and it's going to work perfectly usually it works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the third case, which is um, a classic case, again, for a vascular surgery, you would say, which is a left inguinal uh, surgical wound descent. Uh, inguinal area is tricky because it's in... Um, a deeper uh, area, people bent over there, it's moist, the PP is floating around it, and uh, it can get easily infected. Most of the time, 99% of the time when we do inguinal surgery, there's a serum that forms around the graft, around the artery that we just repair, and it is normal. It's like a blister. And that blister needs to be there and it needs to stay intact and away from the atmosphere so it doesn't get infected. Um, so that's the patient, he's 72 year old. He had uh, a left femoral endarterectomy. And usually when you see this surgery, you need to ask yourself, was this artery repaired with saphenous or bovine or with a synthetic uh, prosthesis? Because you, it's gonna change the antibiotics duration you're going to give, and maybe the aggressiveness you're going to treat that wound, and when you're going to remove the, uh, the stapler. Usually we keep them for two weeks or longer. Uh, that patient came out of the hospital, and then it was good at home, and out of a sudden, that wound de-ist about one per one centimeter and uh, the edges were macerated and it was uh, coming out this liquid, the exudate was um, cloudy a little bit. If we change the slide. So initially we're like, perfect. Yes, it fits. There's a moderate exudate. We don't need any fillers because there's no practical wound under that. It's just an opening in between um, um, uh, the staples and then he went home with that but then we saw him whoop, how do we change that slide oh okay perfect I can talk about pico right now and then we'll move on so the dressing properties of pico is the multiple layers that are already built in one and another if we start from the the portion that touches the bed. This is the, um, the, the tissue that is conforming to the bed and helping the exudate moving through the bed to be absorbed in this super absorbent core. And then after that, it needs to be evaporated through the silicone layers um, that's trans uh, evaporating the liquid outside and just keeping it very tight to the skin. And the silicone is uh, formed to keep the wound uh, sealed from the rest of the atmosphere. So that's basically this. So the, the wound itself usually needs to be two centimeters or less for the pico dressing to reach the bottom of the wound and conform to the bed. And if it's bigger or deeper than this, um, you're gonna need a filler because the pocket of fluid is gonna accumulate in the wound bed and it's gonna probably get infected if, if it's already not infected. So as you can see on the right side, you don't need any fillers. And on the left side, you're going to need the fillers because that pocket of fluid won't uh, reach the bed. What kind of fillers can we use? We talked about that um, earlier in, in the cases that we presented. You can use a gauze. So you, you keep it sterile from the package and then you put it in the wound. Don't overpack it because uh, the wound won't breathe and then it's just gonna accumulate in the gauze and it won't reach the pico. 
and every fillers that you use need to be just in the bed and away from the edges of the wound so it don't macerate because the fluid is going to be in the the fillers and it's going to reach out the pico dressing but it's also going to uh, reach the edge of the skin if they touch the fillers so you need to kind of put it right in the middle that's one uh, filler that you can use the second one on the other slide is a foam. There's different type of foam. The black one is the usual one that we know. It's like the big porous that promotes granulation and that aspirate a lot of fluid in there. You can use also silver. The silver one is the same than the black, but has the silver in it. So it's kind of an antibacterial static one. And you can also use the white one, especially if you want to protect um, an organ under like the bowel. So you want to use Pico because they're not enough fluid and you want to use this white dressing in the bed. You can do that, but just make sure it's just touching the, the bed and not the edges. And um, the fillers needs to be changed every two to three days compared uh, when you use it a pico without a filler because they accumulate fluid in there and you don't want it to be infected if you change again so if you see that wound see now we remove the um the staples and then the wound is still it's small in diameter but it goes deep as three centimeters the wound are less infected, there's no cellulitis, um, the granulation in, in the deepest side of the wound, you see it's kind of okay, it's growing and uh, it's contracting on itself. So probably um, if you use the algorithm, you can use a Pico on it, but you would use a, a foam filler because um, it's deep. If ever you think that this wound is colonized, the patient is incontinent, or there's any sign of low infection, you can use either this gray silver, or we use this act coat um, layer under the pico. We didn't need any, any antibiotics on this one. So then, yeah, we crossed uh, uh, the therapy from traditional to pico. And, and then, also notice that uh, there, there's no hair in the in the periwinkle skin anymore. I don't know whether it's, the, it's been shaved or because the all the the dressing removal has has facilitated the removal of hair. <laughs> I'm a I'm an aesthetician. That's what I do. So <laughs> yeah. So a, a couple of my colleagues they don't shave the patient before, and I feel like when they come back in clinic for either uh, standard dressing or pico dressing or a traditional dressing, it's first not comfortable because we do uh, like this appellation uh, treatment, hair removal for the patient every time we see them, but I feel like it's preventing the dressing from acting normally. There's not a lot of pressure on it. You need a lot of tape around it. So I don't like it. I just shave everyone. Yeah. And that's the wound about uh, 10 to 14 days later. We don't need Pico anymore. The wound is epithelized and uh, it's pretty much healed. So we can go on with his life. Hmm. So if we go back, if we summarize everything that we just said, um, still talking about the challenges that we presented in the beginning, the clinical one, the operational one, and the financial one, and I need to change slides. Um, we, we, that paper that uh, Dr. Wu talked about um, that we came up with, compared those challenges from the traditional one to uh, the single one in the number to treat 12 cases that we studied. And from the operational perspective or feedback, which is us, doctors, nurses, and people that take care of the patient, the satisfaction level was pretty good. Most of the, the people said that the, the algorithm that we provided them, plus the technical skills that it needed to put the dressing on were fairly easy and it was easy to learn and to share with other colleagues. Everybody was 
happy of the ease of the learning of these skills because all the steps were simplified all the components are, are in one dressing from a patient perspective patient satisfaction was great most of the time i feel like the satisfaction from the patient is related to the initial pathology or where the wound is if the wound is um on the foot, they can't walk and they cannot use their foot, whatever dressing you put on, they're not gonna be satisfied. Either it's from traditional or single wound, but if it's in a groin, they still can do all their activity. So I feel like this is also part of the compliance and satisfaction from patient. And the patient's ability to resume activity was faster and better in the single use treatment than in the traditional because they're not bound to the wall and to that big canister. And from, um, this is the same thing we just talked about, just presented in another way, just because I'm seeing the time fly. So uh, we can go faster, but I just see the infection risk. I, I think that with the single use uh, that is changed less and less, uh, the infection risk or reinfection of a wound is less. And we're coming to the economic um, that using either from an inpatient or an outpatient, the single use treatment, people leave the hospital sooner, they don't come back and they go back to their activity faster, which means being useful to society, doing their work, and they don't need to go as frequently in clinics. So the nurses or the doctor can, can see a bigger volume of patient. Um, like it's a community team work, I feel. And I think the, the crux of the, the whole algorithm is to help people to decide on, on the right patient, the right therapy, and the right time to transition from one versus the other. I think, you know, um, as you said, uh, Mary-Claude, uh, this, uh, this few cases really sort of bring home the, the, the tool, the integrating the knowledge and translate that into, into clinical practice quite nicely. Exactly, exactly. That's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is the same thing. This is just another way to express the economic uh, overview of the single use. And um, again, from the operational, from our perspective, doctors and nurses, um, we want to provide care for a patient that is good, that is reliable, you, you, and you want to help that person if they want to help themselves also. Just that being said, I feel that the improvement of quality of life of a patient is, and um, that one uh, negative pressure wound therapy decision tree is easier followed by either the nurse, the doctors, the learnees, or the patient. Oh, we're, we're back. We're back to the poll question. So do you do, do, you do it, Kevin, or? <laughs> it, it should be launched there now for you. You should be able to see on your screen. Oh, perfect. So based on the discussion that we just had, we asked you this question before, how confident do you feel in transitioning or in transition from the traditional therapy to the single therapy? And now you can answer. <laughs> oh, we'll just give like a couple more seconds here. You got lots of responses so far. Oh, this is exciting. Oh. <laughs> I know, eh? It's like looking at the uh, the stock market, you know, the up and down. Uh, <laughs> the election poll, the election polls. And you yeah. should see the responses now in front of you. <laughs> well, I think uh, we have done our, our job, Mary Claude, uh, that uh, a lot of the attendees here, they feel more confident with using um, this kind of algorith algorithm approach to make that decision transitioning individuals from the traditional therapy to single use therapy. So well done. Thank you so much for helping us to appreciate how this kind of, of presentation, this kind of knowledge tool will be able to enhance your practice. And I agree. I think it needs more experience to be comfortable with a technique like we need to practice it, but 
that was good. <laughs> and I'm sorry, people, if I didn't present my stuff because my um, Wi-Fi is not that great. So if I show my face, this is the last time you're going to see it. <laughs> so for a summary, um, do, do you want to start, Kevin, or do you want me to do it? This um, is good. That's okay. I think uh, we we sort of we highlighted some of the key points, and and hopefully that that uh, all of you here um, able to really appreciate the the different therapies out there. And now there's a tool out there, and uh, if you're interested in obtaining this tool, uh, Sub can send you the the link, and it's it's available. You can download it. You can share with people. Talk about it. We love to hear your comments and your feedback. Uh, whether this is really resonate with your clinical practice. So thank you so much. Um, appreciate you uh, being so patient with us and listening to our uh, our um, well, our sharing our uh, ability to to talk about some of those cases. Thank you again. Fantastic, and th thank you both on behalf of NSWAC as well. We've got quite a few questions here. If you don't mind spending just a couple more minutes, maybe we'll get to a couple. We might not be able to get to everything, but just to remember for everybody who is online here, there is gonna be a survey that'll pop up in your browser after the Zoom webinar ends. I believe one of the questions also asked if you wanna get in touch with a, a Smith and Nephew rep as well too. So if any questions you're missing, that's one way of getting in touch, but I'm sure either a sub or a Rose who are in the chat, maybe they can throw their um, the best contact in there. In the meantime, let me ask you just a couple questions here. Uh, the first question is coming up from a little bit earlier on in the presentation, uh, which is if you're getting a hypergranulation with traditional negative pressure wound therapy and still want the edges to close in, what would be an appropriate wound to use PICO for, or could that also contribute to hypergranulation? All right, I'll get a, a give a stab at the at the answer, um, and uh, feel free to chime in anytime, Mary Claude. I, I think if you look at the hypergranulation tissue, so I think you have to think about what's producing those hypergranulation phenomenon. Uh, a lot of times I would think about perhaps because there's a lot of fluid in the wound environment, uh, perhaps it's part of the inflammatory response and that's why you see the hypergranulation. Um, so perhaps we do need to um, uh, maybe using some silver nitrate or other method to remove some of the hypergranulation because um, you're right, um, for the wound to close, we need the epithelial cells, the keratinocytes, to migrate from the wound edge towards the, the center. And, we, and that's why hypergranulation tissue, they're not ideal for wound healing, uh, given the fact that all this, all this keratinocytes had to climb over the mountain to get to the places where they need to, to, to be uh, for the healing purpose, right? Um, so that's why we, we don't like to see a lot of those, those mountains created on the wound bed. Uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, whether, um, whether it is the traditional therapy or the single use therapy, we have, I have seen the hypergranulation tissue in, in either of those cases. I don't think it's unique to one therapy or one device um, alone. I agree. Perfect. Well, thank you for mentioning that. Now we have uh, two questions that are a little bit about uh, uh, wound fillers and wound filling in general, I guess. Here, one question is about what's the max wound depth that can be used um, for for when you're using Pico. What is the max wound depth typically? As Pico typically covers the entire wound rather than filling the wound bed itself. And then the second question, I guess, on the same topic is about if you're using wound filler with uh, uh, SNWT, SNPWT, how often should the dressing be changed? I can answer part of that question if you want. So um, the, I, I don't think, and I haven't really encountered uh, abyssal type of wound, but I think there's no uh, depth. You just need to cover the whole bed with the appropriate feller without stacking it, as long as the Pico's length provided. So like the longer Pico that I have in my hospital is the 40 centimeter one. So if the wound is 40 by um, 20, so you can use that for the whole wound, but the depth, there's no, um, right area for it. You just need to be sure you don't forget the fillers in when you change it and it touching the whole uh, space of the bed. So if the bed of the wound is 
symmetrical, it's easier. But if it has like all those lobulated pockets, I would say maybe the moon isn't ready for um, that type of, um, of dressing. And you need to change it every two to three days. And if I can add one, add one more point, I think it depends on, uh, on, on what kind of space we're talking about, whether it is a depth or a undermining. A lot of times what I have seen at the area where you actually have the, the fascial plane, um, people often think that we have to pack in as much as we can. But when you think about it, uh, the fascia between muscles, it's, it's a natural space. You don't really have to necessarily uh, expect that space to be totally eliminated. Uh, and in fact, sometimes in my opinion is when we're packing into and applying naked pressure by, uh, you don't really have to go all the way to the, uh, to the end of the tunnel per se. Again, you know, I, 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 I say with a caveat, because the negative pressure, the purpose is to um, is to draw the, the tissue together uh, so we can close the, the gap as quickly as possible. Because by putting things into those spaces all the time, of course, you know, those those potential dead space would not be able to close uh, because it's been kept open by your feelers. Uh, so I, I think, you know. I, I say very, very carefully that there is a purpose for packing and there's a purpose for not packing. And I think we can echo uh, Kelly Williams in the chat here is mentioning a fluff don't slough, which is our, or sorry, fluff don't stuff, which is a, always that handy term there. We've seen it a couple other webinars as well. Uh, just bringing us over again, this is maybe a little bit earlier on in the presentation here, but we'll see if we can maybe end off on this one as well. You're talking about the fascia there, um, uh, Kevin, for the abdominal wound case scenario, I think it was the first one we were talking about. Uh, was the fascia intact? And if it was not, would you have avoided the use of negative pressure wound therapy? Uh, were there any other interventions used to remove the slough, like sharp debridement or silver foam? Um, I think about what the first case was. <laughs> um, so to answer yeah, the question, no. <laughs> uh, yes, I think we need to remove uh, as as much non-viable tissue as possible and as comfortable as possible. Um, and, and I'd love to hear about Mary Claude's experience and, and your opinion too, because I think even within the wound care community, there's a, a diverse opinion about when you see fatty, fibrinous tissue, do you aggress, you know, do perform aggressive debridement to really the bleeding point? Um, my, my gut feeling is a lot of times when I see adipose tissue, because it's not highly vascularized. And by the time I come back again, all those sort of globules, they have dried up and they look unhealthy looking. So I do try to clean up as much um, adipose tissue as possible um, for the sort of, uh, for areas that it's not very vascularized. Um, again, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to make, a general statement, a sweeping statement to say, oh, always do this. And that's why wound care is, is such an art and science uh, and, and really try to contextualize what's going on with the patient wound. But in general, I do try to, to clean up as much yellow stuff on the wound bed as possible. Uh, Mary Clark, I, I, I'm curious about your opinion. I think it's, uh, I think you're right. I think you need to debride the mo most of the dead tissue out of the way to promote when you have an underlying bed that is gonna grow. So for vascular patient, diabetes patient that have bones sticking out of their wounds, sometime it's not, you don't wanna be that aggressive cause you're gonna get caught in that vicious circle of removing tissue and um, a rising, uh, uh, how do you say that, getting that wound bigger and bigger over weeks because the vascularization is not good, the, the bed is not good, the bone is sticking out. So sometimes I feel like you just need to see what is going on with the wound before being too aggressive. Just give it a couple of weeks debride gently with Sentol and then leave the knife and the debridement uh, surgical stuff um, on the side 
it's easy to debride a diabetic patient because they don't feel anything, but some of the patients, they really have pain and you don't want to bring them all the time to the uh, operating room to debride them. So sometimes just be patient, just see where that wound is going uh, to do in a couple of days, couple of weeks. If it stays stable, well, probably you're good to remove a little bit more, but if it's deteriorating, meaning like the exit, it's bigger, the bone is sticking out, maybe you just need to start over, like do a new wound, explore what's under and start over again. And as of for, you'd always need to wonder what's under. So for abdominal wound, um, bowels are usually close by, except an obese patient, which can be very deep. You, you have like a lot of room to debride at that point. But if you're not sure, just put like this white sponge or just a gauze over it, and then you'll be okay. The goal is to close the abdomen, like to put new skin on top of the bowel is gonna do an incisional hernia, and then you're gonna go fix him later on in his life. So I think that's an excellent point uh, because uh, patients um, in the wound, they, uh, they do produce endogenous enzyme. They're able to uh, remove all the non viable tissue and let the patient, let the wound look after the healing process. Um, and, and we're there to just to really facilitate the, uh, the, the, the steps. Yeah, just be patient. Sometimes you just need to do nothing and then see what's going on and then react in a couple of weeks, couple of days. You don't need to want to do the right thing right away. Sometimes patience is good. Mm. Perfect. Well, I'm seeing so many thank yous in the chat here. Thank you, says Roxanne. Excellent case studies and wound improvement for those patients. Wonderful to see. Uh, I'm just going to echo those as well. Thank you so much to both of you for sharing your expertise and your phenomenal cases. I'm sure this won't be the last time we'll have a chance to speak with you. But for everyone who's asking about um, looking for uh, an email to contact Smith and Nephew uh, or to, to get access to this recording, you will be getting a survey that will pop up at the end of this um, webinar. You can also see it in the chat there. That's the best way to get in contact uh, in the event that you want to get in contact with Smith and Nephew there. Um, but this will be available as a recording too. Uh, so from uh, across Canada, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you again, Dr. Wu. Thank you again, Dr. Marie-Claude. And we look forward to seeing you in the future. We couldn't have done this without Smith and Nephew again. So we really appreciate the support. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Have a great evening, everybody. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.